to be here. I've heard of this great church for a long time. I've heard of Bishop Kamani for a long time. Daniel Jirogi was a part of that early team, I think. And, and I've spent uh, many hours with Daniel Jirogi and with Michael Beto hearing about Deliverance Church. And uh, I'm here with you now. I'm very thankful for that. I want to tell you that I have strongly felt the presence of God this morning in this place. Did you hear what I said? The presence of the one who said a trillion billion stars in a perfect order. He's created a galaxy and the experts tell us we can go through a wormhole to another galaxy go to a wormhole to another galaxy, he created all of that. Every drop of water that exists in the world, he created, and he's here. Can you believe that? I think sometimes I, I just, you know, I'm, I can't hardly believe it. I'm amazed he's here, and I felt his presence so strongly as I was over here participating in this wonderful worship service. I am very honored to be here with you this morning. I'm going to be reading some verses from the Gospel of Luke. And I'm using some technology uh, to do that. And it's a little slow, but it's, uh, it is coming up. It's the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And it says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country, and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And I see my friend Peterson down here as well. So I'm seeing friendly faces out in the congregation, and I thank you for that. I used to have a bad habit. As a young child, I had a bad habit. I loved to explore caves. You know what caves are? Yeah, holes in the ground. Well, I was... Uh, dumb, to be honest. I was just dumb. I would crawl into any hole in the ground and go down into the caves. Now, where I grew up, it's a limestone area and, and one of the largest caves in the whole world, the Mammoth Cave System, is there, close to where I grew up in Kentucky. But I would go to any cave and I would uh, uh, go through it and explore it. I chose not to go with a guide. I chose not to go with a group. I was not smart, if there are boys and girls listening. I was not smart. I chose to go alone or maybe with one friend of mine. So one day I decided I would explore Bat Cave. It was called Bat Cave because there were bats all inside this cave. My friend and I decided that we would go through it. I had a helmet on my head. I had a flashlight in my hand. And I started going through this huge cave. And, and as we started in, it was so much fun. It was so beautiful. The walls looked like they were covered with silver and, and gold. They were shining. And as I walked further into the cave, I just marveled at the beauty that was in there. Stalactites, stalagmites. Those are those 
uh, things that have been formed by drip, drip, drip over hundreds of thousands of years to make those formations. And I would look at them and I would marvel. And we got to an area that we weren't sure which way to go. We did not have a guide. And we were trying to decide, do we go through this opening? Do we go through this opening? Or do we go through this opening? Well, we chose an opening. We started going through there, and the walls were coming in closer. The cave was getting narrower. And the ceiling was getting lower. We kept going forward. We kept going forward, and pretty soon the walls were just a few inches from our shoulders and just a few inches from our heads and the helmets on our heads. But we kept moving through there with our flashlights and exploring the scenery that was in the cave. As we moved forward, we started walking like this because the ceiling was getting lower and it was getting tighter. As we kept moving forward, we started going like this. And guess what? The flashlight started flickering. Now, have you ever been in a cave with no light. Let me tell you something. You've never experienced darkness before. Never have you seen darkness before. If you've never been in a cave without any light. This is the truth. It is so dark, you can't see that. Can you imagine, have you ever been in that dark of a place and so here we are, and our lights are flickering, and pretty soon we're like this. And we're crawling through this cave, and our lights are starting to flicker, and in just a few moments, <laughs> we were like that. And the ceiling of that cave was bumping against our helmets and I thought that I was going to die. I seriously did. I thought this is it. I'm going to die. Nobody knew we were in there. We hadn't told anybody we're going to go through this cave and those flashlight batteries were losing power and, and we knew that we were coming toward the end we were totally and completely lost. Have you ever been totally, completely lost? No hope, no hope, lost. That's where we were. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? We, we talked to each other and we didn't remember how we got there. As we look back, there were several holes. We didn't remember which one we chose to come through. So all we knew to do was just crawl forward. We were crawling forward and it was, uh, there was a wet, kind of a little mud on the bottom. We're crawling on that because a cave is damp. We're crawling on that and we're moving forward. Pretty soon we found a place where we just slid forward. We slid and we came into a huge room, probably four or five times larger than this room right here. And it was filled with rocks that were as large as this stage and as tall as this stage would be if you stood it up huge stone rocks in this huge room and we're losing power we're totally lost and we're wondering what are we going to do and we saw way on the other side of that cave 
a flicker of light. Just a flicker of light. And so we started moving in the direction of that light and we found a group of people that were going through the cave the right way. They had chosen the guide. And, the, and, and after the guide gave us a stern talk, he allowed us to join them and to go out of the cave. Now, I, my sermon is very simple, and it's very straight, and I have only a single point, but I want you to listen carefully to me. I love sheep. I've raised sheep. I was a sheep farmer for over 20 years. When I sold my sheep operation, I had 200 sheep. And I milked sheep. I milked 60 or 70 sheep. I had a company. I had a business. We milked sheep, and we made sheep's milk cheese. I know what you're thinking. I've never heard of sheep's milk cheese. I'm going to give you an uh, interesting fact that you can use to impress your friends tomorrow. <laughs> you tell your friends that there are more sheep milked in the world than cows. Yeah. It's a very common thing in certain parts of the world. You tell them that, they'll be very impressed. <laughs> well, I love sheep, and so I love this story. But it doesn't make any sense to me as a sheep farmer. Here's why. Now listen to me carefully. So many times we read the simple uh, words of the Scripture and, and we don't see uh, the real meaning that is there, and I want you to see it. Here's a man who had a hundred sheep. That's a lot of sheep, especially in those days. They would have had small groups of sheep. He had a hundred sheep, but, but one was lost. Ninety-nine, if you look at your scripture... It says 99 were in the open. Does your scripture say that? Mine? I just read it a moment ago. 99 of the sheep were in the open. He could not find the one sheep. And so he left the 99 sheep that were safe, that were in the open, and he left those sheep, and he went to try to find the lost sheep That makes no sheep business sense whatsoever. Now, I know that people love to read that story and they think, oh, how wonderful. He left those 99 and he went out to find that one lost sheep. I'm telling you, from a business perspective, I had lunch the other day at Edgerton College and, uh, and we were having lunch with one of the professors in the agricultural school there. I didn't ask him about this, but I could have. Listen, when you own livestock, and I'm sure some of you here own livestock, you know you lose some, don't you? Some are going to die. I mean, you're not happy about it. That's the way it is. And, and from a business perspective, uh, you know there's a certain percentage of loss. You expect it. That's a business deal. You got a hundred and you lose one. Hey, man, you're doing fantastic. There's, there's no livestock farmer in Kenya. There's not a single livestock farmer in Kenya who would not love to be guaranteed that he would only have 1% loss. Man, that's wonderful. You got a hundred cows, you're probably going to lose six or eight. You got a hundred sheep, you're going to lose maybe eight or nine. That's, that's the way it is with livestock. So please see that what Jesus is teaching here makes no business sense. It, he doesn't want to make a business principle. This is a kingdom of God principle. 
And hear me, if you don't hear anything else I say, I want you to hear that. Because so many of you are told every day of your life by the world to make good business sense and use good business principles. Now, don't get me wrong. In your business, you need to be a good businessman. But what I'm saying is that if you're a Christian, you need to be driven primarily by kingdom principles, not business principles. That one sheep matters to God. That's the difference. That's the difference. If it was just business, God would have said, hey, you know, you've done pretty well this year. You just lost this one. No, that's, that's real good. You've done very good. But that's not what it's about. What I would love for you to do today is walk out of here determined that you're going to follow kingdom principles in your life. Because let me tell you something. You have lost sheep all around you all the time. And you know you're concerned about them. I can tell that. You're concerned about them. But you know what you're concerned about more? You own a, you've got a pile of something. You've got a pile of something. It may be you've got a little pile of money. It may be you've got a large pile of money. It may be you've got a business that you're having to work so hard to keep it going. And your heart and your mind is drawn to that and protecting that pile. Now, there's nothing wrong with good business principles. But if you maintain business principles and you don't have an eye for kingdom principles and kingdoms, God's kingdom business, he cannot use you. He cannot use you. You've got to be willing to have a heart for that one that's out there and that is lost. I've been traveling all over, uh, or not all over, but uh, in parts of Kenya for the last several days. I've seen some lost sheep. We spent some time with a young girl named Sarah who finished standard eight and scored 388. She's living with her grandmother in a very difficult situation. She's a lost sheep. She's a lost sheep. Who's going to go find, who's going to go leave this pile that you're protecting? And who's going to go find Sarah? And the Bible tells us that when the shepherd found that lost sheep, he put it up on his shoulders and he brought it back into the safety of the fold and they all rejoiced. So can you rejoice with me this morning that someone, Dr. Beto, has found Sarah and Sarah is being brought into a fold. Sarah is being placed, uh, uh, given an opportunity for an education. She's a lost one. And I want us to focus for just a second on the fact that when the shepherd put that lost sheep on his shoulders and he came back into the rest of the sheep, there was rejoicing. Listen, folks. We've got to be careful that we know when to rejoice and when to search. There are so many of us that are quick to rejoice and slow to search. And while God loves our rejoicing, and it's a sweet aroma, a fragrance of worship to Him, He also has a heart that's thinking, don't you know about this one that's right over here, not that far from where you are. Would you leave there for just a moment? Leave there for just a moment and go find that one, that lost one, and bring it back. I know what it feels like to be completely lost. 
I was completely lost at one time in my life. And God moved in my life with the conviction and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And God loved me into the kingdom of God. I prayed and I invited Christ into my heart and life. And he changed my heart. And I can see him now. When Timothy, my name, when I was brought on his shoulders back into the fold. But would you join me in making a commitment? I'm making a commitment. Will you join me in making a commitment to have a heart for those that are in the darkness of the blackest cave? They're lost. And a willingness to leave business, business principles, whatever your business is that takes your time and attention. It could be your home. It could be your family. It could be a business, literally. It could be a vocation. It could be a hobby. Will you, will you join me in leaving those in safety and going out to find that one which is lost? Pastor.